Good morning, Trace Church. No, really, good morning, Trace Church. Yeah, you can talk, it's okay. Uh, you know, I'm here with my wife and daughter this morning. We feel right at home this morning. Uh, first of all, we attend Impact Christian Church up in Moreland Park, and we both our churches have ties to Sunnyside Christian Church, which is pretty cool. Uh, our, one of our elders and our children's director up there are the aunt and uncle for Josiah, your student minister here. And then we also know Dr. T and Kirsten. Yeah, we all went to the same church in Louisiana. See, I knew before he was Dr. T, he was just T. And so, but he did let me know before I got up here, he said, look, if you need a professional to step in, just let me know and he'd come up. So if I go down, just come on, okay? Okay. Uh, we are definitely glad to be here today. As Aaron told you, I serve as the global director for Celebrate Recovery. So I'm going to introduce myself just like I would at any Celebrate Recovery. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and it was my struggles with drugs and alcohol that brought me here. My name is Mac. Okay, so everybody who just answered then, they're the ones, that are, they're the messy people. They're the ones in recovery. Keep your eye on them. And then we're going to try it again. See, when I say that, you all respond with, hi, Mac, and I know I'm in the right place, okay? I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and it was my struggles with drugs and alcohol that brought me here. My name's Mac. Amen. Oh, now I know I'm at home. Okay, I like that. Thank you guys so much. You know, I am so excited to hear that you guys are considering this ministry called Celebrate Recovery, and you've been waiting for just the right time to start this ministry because Celebrate Recovery, or CR as we call it, is a ministry that helps people recover from any hurt, hang up, or habit. And I'm still trying to figure out who doesn't have one of those. If you made it through life without a habit or a hang up, there's no way you made it through life without hurting someone or getting hurt yourself. So this ministry is for anybody. Or as Aaron said in one of his sermons, which by the way, I've been watching some of those on YouTube. I'm not a stalker or anything. I just like to see what our sister church is believing. And I'll just say this right up front. You guys get it. You get it. I mean, you, you, you can't hide and heal at the same time. This is a church about messy people. That, you know, God only used broken people to advance his kingdom, and you guys get it. So I am proud to be here to be a part of this today. And here's what Aaron said in one of his sermons that I, that I just picked up on immediately. He said, wherever there are people, there are hurts, and it's not supposed to be that way. That's not how God designed it. But you know what? As humans, we brought those hurts in the picture, and now we need some recovery. That's why I love Celebrate Recovery, because it has helped us find healing for more hurting people than I ever could have imagined. And at the same time, I want to say this to you. It is not, Celebrate Recovery is not the source of our recovery or the source of our healing. It is a fantastic resource that points people to the source, Jesus Christ. And that's what this ministry is about, about pointing people to Jesus Christ who are hurting. So you might be thinking already, well, he has used the word recovery quite a lot already. Is that, and by the way, some people ask me, is recovery even in the Bible? Well, I'm gonna show you something real quickly. Hang on. Hang on. No, that's Exodus. That's too far. Okay, here's Genesis chapter 3. Okay, so this part of the Bible right here, the little skinny part, that's where God said, here's how I want you to live. This will be a good way for you to live. Well, we took that. We messed it up really badly. Then he gave us the recovery part. That's this part. So yeah, recovery's all throughout the Bible. Here's what I want to talk to you guys about this morning. I want to talk to you guys about going from bad to good, or, or even from good to great, because I believe this. I believe that we are destined for greatness, and by now, you, you guys know that I am in recovery myself. I've been in recovery for a few years now, and, and I hang around with a lot of people that are in recovery, and I was so glad when I, when I first heard the first person say to me that they had a committee living in their head, and I was like, me too. You hear voices? They said, oh yeah, we hear voices. And sometimes I hear so many voices, they outvote me. You know, so I really have to pay attention to the voices that I hear today because here's what I understand, that I have to learn to discern which voice that I need to listen to. You know, and I'll give you an example. 
I can be standing talking to somebody with a cup of hot coffee in my hand, and in my mind there's a voice that says, I wonder what would happen if I poured this on them. Now, look, you don't have to worry if you see me with coffee. I, to date, I have not poured coffee on anybody, so don't worry, because today I choose not to act on what that voice in my head says. So my life now centers around listening to the right voice and acting on that voice instead of the other ones. Some of you have acted and lived on the voices that told you things like you were worthless. You'll never amount to anything. What are you even doing here? Others of you have listened to your own voice that says, you know, I am really pretty good. At least I'm not as bad, don't point, but at least I'm not as bad as those people, right? The ones that have the real problems. So we come to church or to celebrate recovery thinking things like, you know, I'll go, but it's really not going to do any good. I'm just too bad. I'm beyond help. Or we come thinking, I've pretty much got everything all together, so I'll go help those really messed up people. You know, the prodigals, the ones that are in the deepest, stinkiest, dirtiest mud of all the pig pens. Well, before we get too far, I would like you to consider this. I believe that everyone in here who is following Jesus Christ is a prodigal. No matter what voice you've listened to, even if you identify more with the older brother in the story of the prodigal son, because in telling himself how good he was and all the good things that he'd done, he found himself in his own pig pen, even though he never left the house. So the question is, what voice are you listening to? It reminds me of Boudreaux. You know, Boudreaux, if you're from Louisiana, you got to tell a Boudreaux joke every once in a while. Boudreaux was going to the grocery store, and he went to the grocery store. He stepped up on the front porch, and there was a parrot sitting there. And that parrot looked at him, and that parrot said, hey. Boudreaux said, what? That parrot said, you ugly. Well, now, Boudreaux is mildly irritated, but he said, you know, it's just a, that's a dumb bird. I'm going in this store, get what I came for, then I'm leaving. So he went in the store, got what he came for. He came back out, and that bird's looking at him again. Boudreaux's trying to not look at him, but that bird said, hey. Boudreaux said, what? That bird said, you ugly. Now he is really mad. So he goes back in that store, he tells that store owner, he says this. I don't know who that bird belonged to out there, but I guarantee you this. If he say to me what he'd been saying to me, he ain't going to leave that porch alive. That owner of the store said, Boudreaux, settle down, man. It's just a bird. I guarantee you he will not say to you what he's been saying to you. He ain't going to say it again. Boudreaux said, well, they better not. That's all I got to say on the matter. So he went back outside trying to not look at that bird, but that bird's looking at him. The bird said, hey. Boudreaux said, what? That bird looked at him and said, you know. <laughs> you know, it's time to stop listening to the voices that have been directing our steps, whether you thought you were really, really good or really, really bad, and listen to the only voice that matters and take into consideration what the creator of the cosmos and beyond says about us. And today I would submit to you that because of what God says about you, every one of us who is a follower of Jesus Christ is destined for greatness. And you might think, whoa, whoa, Mac, that's a little bit arrogant, right? I mean, because didn't God tell us to be humble? To which I would say, exactly. He told us to be humble, humble enough to realize that if I run my life on my own power, I will crash and burn every time. If I listen to my own voice or the voice of others. But when God takes control, when I relinquish my control to him, that's when he stoops down from on high and says, I want to lift you out of that slimy pit, set you on a high place, and make you great. And he said that, not me. Listen to this verse, Psalms 1835. You, O oh God, give me your shield of victory, and your right hand sustains me. You stoop down to make me great. That's God's words, not mine. So when we finally come to the end of ourselves, the creator of everything we know and beyond is looking for ways to bring the prodigals back home. He's creating ways to do that. Have you ever read through the Bible, then all of a sudden you read through it, and you're like, where did that verse come from? Man, I've read through the Bible, I don't know how many times, but all of a sudden this last year, I, I found a verse, I'm like, seriously? How long has that been there? 
It was 2 Samuel 14, 40. It goes like this. Pay attention to this really closely. Like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be recovered, we must die. So he's saying to us that all of us have been appointed once to die, right? We can't get out of that unless Jesus comes back first. We can't get out of that. We're going to die. Listen to what he says next. Physically, that is. But, anytime God says but, you need to pay attention, right? But God does not take away life. Hold it, I thought you just said we're all going to die. Exactly. This is two kinds of deaths. First he said physically, you are going to die. But then he says spiritually, you're going to die too. But it says, but God does not take away life. Who gave up our life? We did. Spiritually, we made choices that separated us from God. And spiritually, we died. But God does not take away life. Instead, I love it when God says instead too. He's going to say something different. Instead, he devises ways so that the banished person may not remain estranged from him. Did you get that? That's good news. He says, I am looking for ways to bring you back home. I'll invent ways. I'll create ways. You may be miserable in the meantime, but I'll make a way for you to get back home. That's good news. So we have to develop a baseline of who needs help and who doesn't. And I would make the point right here that everyone, no matter how good we've been, were at one time cut off from God. Romans 3.23 takes care of that, right? For all, who's that leave out? (laughs) Nobody. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So unless you're Jesus Christ or an angel that's still in heaven, we all have a problem. And that problem is that all of us were cut off from God no matter how good we were. Yeah, Mac, but I mean, you hang around a pretty rough crowd. That recovery crowd, right? We know some good people. Well, I do too. You know, I never forget when I first became a Christian, there was a man who became part of my life, and me and my friends really watched him closely because what we saw in him is what we wanted. We wanted to live our life like he was living, following Jesus Christ. I mean, he was the most spiritual man we knew. He seemed like he never messed up. We never saw him mess up. His wife was spiritual. His kids were spiritual. His dog never pooped where it shouldn't have pooped. It never messed up. Nobody messed up in this family. And we thought, man... He has got to be an angel. So one day we were alone with him. We said, look, we've got a question we want to ask you. Are you an angel? And he looked at us and laughed and said, no, I'm not an angel. And I looked at the guys around me. I said, you know, I think that's exactly what an angel would say. So we still weren't convinced. So we went and talked to his wife. She told us God called him a saint, but he was no angel. She testified to that. But the most holy man that we knew, this is the important part, the most holy man we knew, he needed to be rescued too. And that is where every one of us sitting in this room finds ourselves today. We came up short. Or as God wrote with his finger on the wall to King Belshazzar, meeny, meeny, tekel, parson. Translated means you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. I love the way it says in the NLT because there's no room for error here. You have been weighed on the balances and you, Mac Owen, failed the test. And you're in the same boat with me. So I would say to you and me that our best efforts to live this holy life came up short and we found ourselves separated from God. That's point one. Point one is there was no one good enough in and of themselves to be in God's presence. We all have the potential to be prodigal sons and daughters. All of us were separated from God. All of us came up short. All of us failed the test. Point two, the rescue. You know, growing up in the swamps and bayous of Louisiana, every young man aspires to have two things, a boat and a four-wheel drive pickup truck. 
So at 19 years old, I had saved up. I had an old boat, and I finally saved up enough, enough money to buy a brand new 1978 Ford four-wheel drive, $6,000 right off the showroom floor. I was so proud. I went immediately, jacked that thing up, put the biggest tires that I could find on it. No mud hole was going to be off limits to me because in Louisiana, mud is not a natural disaster. It's something we play in. And I was ready. Well, one particular Friday night, I was out with my girl, Mary. We'd been married two years at this point, and I was going to impress her. I was still, you know, at 45 years, I'm still trying to impress her. Sometimes we just need to grow up, man. No, nah, no, nah, impress your women. Do it, do it. But anyway, I'm still trying to impress her, so I go looking for this big old mud hole. I'm going to conquer it, whatever it is. We're going to find the biggest one, and boy, did I find it. We came on this pipeline, it was like a miniature lake out there. And it was just me and her out in the middle of the woods and during the, about nine o'clock at night, I said, oh yeah, baby, this is it right here. And she was impressed that I was gonna even try this thing. So I took off, man, I locked in the hubs, I revved it up and I, oh, I took off and I got about a hundred feet in and I noticed the truck is going much slower now and the headlights are underwater and instead of going forward, it starts just going straight down. So I stopped. I had enough sense to do that. I stopped and I looked out the windows and the water was now two inches below the window, the driver's side window. And I thought, uh-oh, we got problems. So I'm thinking of what I could do. The winch is underwater. I got nothing I could do. I mean, so I needed help. But you know, this was going to be embarrassing. I mean, my friends were going to give me some serious grief over that. But I knew this. I wasn't going to get out alone. So I swallowed my pride. I climbed out the window. Mary got on my back. I took her out of the water. Then we walked to a payphone about two miles away. I called a friend. And I said, look, man, I'm stuck out here. And after he finally got through laughing... He said, look, I'll be there in just a little while. So we got a ride close to our truck, and we waited there at our truck. What I didn't know was that my friend had called more of my friends and told them of my predicament, too. Well, we were sitting there waiting, and, and all of a sudden, the lone pickup truck crested the hill. And then, before it was over with, 25 trucks and Jeeps were also there, ready to help rescue us. And you know, I tell that story because in that moment, I'll never forget the feeling of being loved. Because my friends, our friends, stopped what they were doing and came to our rescue. Before the night was over, six more trucks would get stuck rescuing us, but eventually we all made it out and we all made it home. You know what is so special about that story to me was when I came to realize God does the same thing. When I call on him, he stops what he's doing and he comes to my rescue. You know, my favorite chapter in the Bible is Psalms 18 because it very clearly and concisely shows how God works to bring us back home when we call out to him from the depths of our heart. You know, David, who was a man after God's own heart, finds himself at death's doorstop. He's in the middle of a battle, and not only did it say he called out to God, it said he cried out from the depths of him, cried out to God for help. And I love what it says next. From God's home, it says from his home, God heard my cry, and he became angry. Angry at David? No way. He was angry at the enemy who was bringing death to one of his own, his son, David. Then something amazing happens. I love this because it says, God himself parts the heaven and says, God came down to rescue the one that would harm, was getting harmed from the enemy. Then riding the clouds, being driven by the wind, and he starts throwing hailstones and bolts of lightning to rout the enemy. And I love it when it says this, the enemy is subdued, and then he reaches down from on high, plucks David off the battlefield just in the nick of time before the enemy slays him. And David would say this in verse 17 of chapter 18. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. 
They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. Listen to this closely. He brought me into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Did you hear that? He rescued David because he delighted him, not because he loved him. God loves everybody. He is love. He's got to do that, right? But now he rescued David because he just liked him. And if you like somebody, what do you like to do with them? You like to do things with them, right? You see, David, a man after God's own heart, was a prodigal too. And God wanted him home. David would later say in Psalm 70, verse 5, I'm in deep trouble, rush to my aid, for only you, God, can help and save me. So you have to ask yourself, now here's a man after God's own heart, and he cries out for help. How easy is it for you to ask for help? Especially in those embarrassing moments when you've done something you'd really rather nobody else knew that you did. How easy is it for you to pick up that 900 pound phone and call somebody and say, I need help? Because in asking for help in anything, it means that you can't do it. For many of us, I know for me that's hard to do, to admit that I need someone else's help. You know, people might think I'm weak or foolish or somehow less than this perfect image that I like to portray to everybody if I ask for help. I'm going to let you in on a little secret right now. Those of you who are doing okay and you're here to help the rest of us and you're trying to maintain that perfect exterior so no one knows that you struggle too, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Here it is. Get ready. Take them trace pins out. Write it down. We know you struggle too. None of us are perfect. We all struggle. It doesn't matter how much good you have going on. You know, in the story of the prodigal son found in Luke 15, which I believe, again, we can all find ourselves, we see that after the son wishes his father dead, because that's what he did in taking the inheritance, right? He wished his father dead. Give me the money. Then he leaves for a distant country. And we think, how foolish. I would never do that. I mean, leave the security and the wealth of my father's home to go out and be on my own. No way. I would not do that, really. Think about it. How many of us have gone to that distant country of accumulating wealth or things or that land of power, or status, and admiration, or prestige. You know, people look up to me. Or those slightly closer distant countries of sexual gratification, or that land of drugs, or alcohol, or food. You know, every one of us at one time have found ourselves in that distant country of self-reliance. I can do this. I don't need help. Listen to this. I am a prodigal son every time I search for unconditional love where it cannot be found. The only place true unconditional love is, is in our Father's house. You see, the Father loves us so much, and this is the hard part. He loves us so much that He allows us to leave with the risk that we may not make it back. And believe me, he will use whatever he can to encourage our trip home because he's standing on that hill, looking as far as he can see, waiting on the day that we make our way back home. And so he'll encourage that trip home because he devises ways to bring us back. So maybe like the younger son, we find ourselves in a place where nobody really cares if we're around or not. They don't care if we see our face again. He'll use that to bring us home. Or a place where we no longer receive that respect, that admiration, that praise that I know I deserve, he'll use that to bring us home. Or a place where drugs and alcohol and sex and food, they don't comfort me anymore. Guess what? He'll use that to bring us home. You see, he's looking for any excuse, any reason to bring us home. And he'll use whatever 
is at his disposal. And if that means getting you down in the stinkiest, muddiest pig pen that he can find where people don't care if you're around anymore, he'll use that to bring us home. Or if it means that you're in that three-piece suit on the corporate ladder somewhere and, and you, you have a lot of success, but it's on the backs of other people and they don't want you around, he'll use that to bring you home. Or if you're that church leader who got caught looking at porn, well, on the computer in the church office, and they've now asked you to leave. Guess what? He'll use that to bring you home. He'll use whatever we place in our lives above him to humble us and bring us back home. You see, our Father longs to hear these four words from us. Can I come home? That's what the younger brother asked. Can I come home? To a place where we're welcome to return, even when and especially when we show up totally empty-handed. Totally. It's in the realization that when I go home, I got nothing. Listen to this. I got nothing to offer except my broken life. That's it. When I got here, he wasn't looking for anything else. He just wanted to know if I had surrendered, if I had given up, and I had. All I had was my broken life, and I said, it's yours. That's what he's looking for. It's in that moment of brokenness that I come to a limited understanding that my father has been waiting on me to return. He's been waiting on you to return. And with his shield of victory, he wants to sustain me. And with his mighty right hand, he wants to lift me out of that slimy pit. And he stoops down from on high to lift me up and make me great. Why does he make us great? Why does he want to do that? For at least two reasons. First of all, to show us how much he loves each and every one of us. Secondly, is so that we could show others that that same love is available to them too. This can't be a selfish deal. Okay, I got what he wants. I'm going to keep it now. No, because then we enter the pig pen again. It's got to be, okay, I got it. Now I'm going to give it away. That's what he does this for. We can't afford to sit this one out. We've got to enter the race. Coming to that realization that God says we're worth everything. Do you get that? No matter how jacked up you've been, how messed up you've been, God says you're worth it all. I'll prove it and I'll give my son. You're worth everything. So point three, we enter the race knowing this. We when you know there's a, a hill here in Colorado actually you guys call it a hill I'm from Louisiana so it ain't no hill it's a mountain I know it is and, and, and it's not too far from where we live here and people come from all over the world to climb this thing right here you know that it's called the incline all of you in here have heard of it and then probably a good many of you may have even climbed this thing but if you haven't, and you may be thinking, well, it doesn't look that hard. It's only a mile long, right? Well, in that mile, it ascends 2,000 feet vertically from 6,000 feet to 8,000 feet in one mile. And the average grade is 45 degrees, which is pretty steep, steep all the way up to 68 degrees. It has 2,744 steps, and they're all at different heights. Nobody called a code on this one. Nobody called the inspector. They're all at different heights. It will test every bit of metal you have just to get to the, at least it does mine. It tests everything I have to get to the top. So when I start climbing this thing, which I like to do one or two times a year, and not because it's a nice hike. If you're looking to go hiking, go somewhere else. This thing is not a hike. It's an endurance test. That's the only reason I could do it, to see if I can make it to the stop, top still. When you start this thing, the oxygen is thin, but not that bad. And when I start out climbing this thing, I start out taking two steps at once. I'm thinking, oh yeah, I'm feeling pretty frisky here. I'll just two steps at once. All right, well, it doesn't take long before I'm taking one step at a time. 
You know, and about three quarters of the way up, you see this summit and you think, oh yeah, I got this. And you get there and it's a false summit. It's not even the one you're looking for. Who put that there? And by the time I get there, I'm like, man, I don't even know if this is worth it. Then somebody passes you by and, and they say something like, hey, it's a great day for a climb. See you at the top. And I'm like, who is this idiot? I can't even talk right now. I'm just thinking these things now because I cannot talk. I'm just trying to breathe. Maybe I should turn back. And by this time, I'm thinking, no, I can do this. And I'm taking that, what I call the incline shuffle. So now to make one step, I shuffle twice and go set. Shuffle twice and one step. I mean, I'm barely making it now. And then on that rare occasion, I actually pass somebody. And then I, my chest sticks out, and I'm like, oh, yeah, what a stud I am. And then I realize I am just one slow turtle passing a slightly slower turtle. And I tell them, hey, I'll see you at the top. <laughs> then all of a sudden, you see the real summit. And you get that burst of energy. And you start going that last, I don't know how long it is, but you get to the top. And there are people there, and they start clapping and cheering. And I'm looking around at them like, what are they doing? It's like, I won the thing. And it's in that moment you realize nobody was here to come in first place. We all won. There were no winners and losers. The fact that I was able to get out of bed and make it to the top, we all won. So we find ourselves in the race of life. God makes us great. So we'll come in first place? No, not a chance. God makes us great so we can tell others that are in the race that they win too. You know, there's going to be days in life when you're barely taking two steps at one time. Everything's feeling good. You're whistling. Then there's going to be days that you're taking... The shuffle, two, sh two steps just to make one. And you'll be thinking, is it worth it? And then somebody will come by and say, hey, I'm praying for you today. I know you're having a tough time. And, and you, th you get reinvigorated and you say, I can do this. Then there's going to be days when everybody's just passing you by and you think, is this worth this? And then you remember that we win. So yeah, it's worth it. I'm going to keep going. Then you'll pass somebody having a bad day and you'll encourage them to keep going. And then you'll wonder if it's worth it when you think you're almost to the top and you have to face another character defect or struggle in your life. I don't know if I can do this. And you look back for just a moment and you see all the steps you've taken and you say, no, I can do this. I can do this. And you finally reach the top and it's in that moment of realization that you realize I was made for this because God made me to be great. I was made to help others. So with this realization of now giving away what we've been given, we share with others no matter, listen to this, no matter their station in life. It doesn't matter if they are, uh, uh, you know, the, a worse prodigal than you were. We don't get disgusted by that. And we're not intimidated by people who have a greater station in life than we do. We're not intimidated or disgusted because this message is for everybody you know, I'll never forget when someone brought the head of a doctoral program to our uh, cabinet shop. He was from a local university, and we had a Bible study at 6 o'clock in the morning, two days during the week. And they brought him, and I, I looked at him, and I'm thinking, man, what am I ever going to share with this guy? He's got more degrees than even he can remember. I don't know what I'm going to do to share with him. So I just started reading out of God's Word, and we were in Thessalonians chapter uh, uh, one verse six, where it says, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when our Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. As soon as I said that, his hand rose so enthusiastically, I was like, what is he going to say? Because he was definitely stopping me right then. So I was like, uh, yes, sir. He said, now who's going to punish who in this verse? I said, well, in this verse, God punishes the disobedient. 
He responded with, I thought Satan was a punisher. I said, well, not here. God is the one who's doing the punishment. And then he looked at me with those, one of those extremely educated professor looks that knew that you weren't going to move on unless he told you you could. And he looked at me and he said, carry on. This is pressing information. So I carried on. And then I asked him afterwards if he wanted to do a Bible study, just me and him. Well, after about three Bible studies, he told me something I'll never forget. He said this. Sometimes I feel as though I've been educated well beyond my intellect. This message that you shared with me is so simple, I almost missed it. I want the same thing you have. I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. God's given us a simple message. You see, on the other end of that spectrum, I shared with a man who was skid row alcoholic who lived under bridges and was illiterate, couldn't read a word. He heard the message of hope in, in Jesus and, and was cut to the heart, but he just could not believe that this was for him. There was no hope for him. He'd just been too bad. And I assured him there was hope for him too. Well, he started coming to celebrate recovery for about six months and he came every week religiously. He came every week, but then one night he wasn't there. I wondered where he was, and one of my friends said, oh, I know, he went out and got drunk. Somebody knew where he was, so me and a friend went to find him. He was in an old rundown flea bag motel, I promise you, in the middle of nowhere. It took us forever to get there. I found where he was, knew what door, uh, room he was in, went and knocked on the door, and he came to the door, hung over, and said this to me, what are you doing here? Well, I simply said, I came to get the brother that I loved. That broke his heart because he'd never been part of a family ever. You know, it's blood family, nobody that cared anything about him, nothing. You know, we took him home in the middle of the night, fixed him some breakfast and sobered him up. You know, there's nothing like bacon and eggs at three o'clock in the morning when you've been drunk. Just give, yeah, give him, man, give him that bacon and eggs. It'll sober anybody up. Forget the coffee. You know, that was 28 years ago. And about a year ago, Rusty went to heaven. You know what he was? He was still sober. He could read. And he was sharing the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, with others. Sharing with others, there was hope for them too. So here's what we've looked at today. Let's wrap it up. Point one. There was no one, not one of us, that was good enough in and of ourselves to be in God's presence. We are all prodigal sons and daughters if we follow Jesus Christ. All of us were separated from God. All of us came up short. Point two, there had to be a rescue. Without the rescue, we're doomed. Point three, you were made to enter the race because our Father has lifted you up to be great. You know, the greatest people I know in life are the ones that give away what they've been giving. And if you're sitting here today and you're a follower of Jesus, a destiny of greatness is waiting for you. Pick it up. Run with it. Don't squander this. Don't let anything get in the way. You were made for such a time as this. And, and some of you may be sitting here thinking, why isn't my life going as planned? Well, it may be because of that thing that you're not talking to anybody about, that thing that's holding you back, that you know about, maybe nobody else knows about, but you've got it there, and it's standing in the way between you and your relationship with God and the life that He had planned for you. I would say this, don't leave here today keeping that to yourself. Because right now, you have a chance to take that to the cross and give it to the one, the only one who can take it away for good, Jesus Christ. You know, as I told you, I, um, I've been watching, loving watching Aaron on YouTube, and he said something that I'm going to tell him right now, I'm going to use this, I'm going to steal it. I'll give you credit the first couple times, but after that, <clears throat> if you're here today and you've got something that's standing in the way, of your relationship with God and your relationship with others. Tell someone. Don't leave here today without telling somebody. If you do, I guarantee you, by the time you get to the parking lot, you're gonna convince yourself that it's just not that bad. But right now you're thinking about it, it's bad. 
Don't leave here today without telling somebody. Then take a step in the right direction towards the cross and then trust again. This is a family you can trust. This is a safe place. Trace Church is a safe place. Let's pray. Father, man, we can sure mess things up, but I am reminded that you only use broken people to advance your kingdom. I pray today, Father, if anybody's here today holding on to something that is in between their relationship with you, that they give it up and give it away and give it to Jesus in his name. Amen.